Hi, welcome to A Love Statistics. This will cover the Edexcel course. We're going to start with Chapter One, which is all about data collection. So, there's two main things to this chapter: you basically all these definitions we're going to cover now, and there's also a large data set. So, first, we have basically all this information that you need to know what it means, and basically the advantages and disadvantages of various things. So, some key terms: population. That is basically everyone you want to sample. Okay, so if we're talking about a school, it will be everyone at that school. If you're talking about a country, it will be everyone who lives inside that country. Next, we have a census. So a census is where you are going to interview everyone in that population. Okay, so typically you're always asked what's good about this and what's bad about this. So good about it is that everyone's accounted for, no one's missed out and there's going to be no bias. It's going to be a perfect representation. The downside is it's very hard logistically, it's very expensive and it's very time consuming. Okay, let's look at sampling. So sampling is a way rather rather do a whole census, you can just look at a smaller group and hope that it represents the overall population. That's always the aim. We have five types that you need to know. First things first is simple random sampling. So let's say I want a sample of N. What you would do is you would just assign everyone a number and you would generate N random numbers and you would pick those N people. One important thing to mention with this there is a special case where if you generate the same number twice, you might need to generate an extra number. Okay, so basically there's a clause where you can't have any repetition. Next, we have systematic sampling. Okay, this is the same idea, except you're going to go through the go through the population in the same jumps. So, for an example, if you had a population of 1000 and you wanted a sample of 50 what you could do is you could pick a random person or pick a random number from 1 to 4 or 1 to 5 actually and then we're going to add 5 to that number each time so pick a random number from 1 to 5 and then pick every fifth person after that so if I picked one first, I'll then pick 1, 6, 11, 16. If I pick two first, I'll then pick 2, 7, 12, 17, etc, etc. Okay, this is basically easier than simple, simple random sampling because there's no chance of getting repetitions. Uh, the only downside here is you're assuming that your numbered system is perfectly fair. There's no sort of clusters or people being missed out or anything like that. Next, we have stratified sampling. So this works when you can neatly divide your group into nice categories, okay? So the example you often have is gender, which I know isn't entirely true, and also like um, year groups at school. So we can divide our group into categories and we're gonna make sure that people we sample from each category represents the whole population, okay? So for example, if I had 100 people in year 11, 50 in year 10, and 50 in year nine, you'd have to make sure you, you get twice as many from year 11, okay? The way the maths works is you work out what fraction of the entire population is year 11, in this case it's half, and make sure half your sample size is from year 11, okay? This brings on nicely to quota sampling. Quota sampling is roughly the same thing. So what you might say for quota sampling is I want 50 men and 50 women. However, the downside of this is it might be a company where there's a thousand men, but only 300 women, okay? So for quota sampling, you would basically have preset quotas for what you want to uh, interview. 
So the advantage is fairly quickly set up. The downside is it, of course, could be biased. Okay, if your preset quota is not, not representative of the whole population, then you're going to be introducing bias there. Last one, the nice easy one, is opportunity sampling. So the example is always given. Say you want to interview some people at a supermarket. You turn up, 9 a.m., interview the first 10 people you see, and then go home. That is opportunity sampling. Okay? So it's basically whatever is convenient. The advantage of this is it's super quick, super cheap. Disadvantage, of course, is going to be bias there. So if I interview people at 9 o'clock in the morning, then that's going to cause some bias for the kind of people who are at the supermarket at that time. Okay, those are your free sampling methods. Uh, you're often asked to say which are uh, random. I think basically agreed that these three are random. Everyone should be equally likely as everyone else to be selected. That's what random means. And the last two are not random. Okay, that's the sampling done. We have two types of data you need to know. You have quantitative and qualitative. The way I remember it is I know quantitative sounds a bit like quantity. And that represents any data which is stored by just a number. So it's data you can represent by a number, um, such as height, such as weight, such as rainfall. We then have qualitative data, which is the complete opposite. You cannot represent this by a number. So for example, hair color, eye color, and so on and so forth. Okay, after that, we're nearly done. We have two kind of variables. We have continuous variables and discrete variables. Continuous, it can take any number possible. So the classic example is height. So someone's height could be 155.4726 etc centimeters. Okay, that's continuous because I can divide it into a small and smaller and smaller quantities as I want to. We then have discrete variables. They can only take specific numbers. And the classic example tends to be shoe size. So for example, shoe sizes, I count B size 11 and an eighth. Okay, shoe size is a bit of a weird one because you can have halves, but normally for the street variables you can't have halves, but it still counts because you've got a specific range of values you can take. Okay, that's a lot to take in and a lot to remember, but it is all stuff you are expected to know. Okay, moving on. We have roughly the same kind of massive stuff to remember with the large data set okay so first of all what it is the large data set is basically a massive spreadsheet file that covers web information I think from the 1980s up until 2015 and across various cases in the world the sum in England and the sum all over the place you're expected to know various quirks and basically what things are being measured. Okay, so I've highlighted a few important things I'm going to mention right now, and I'll mention some sort of things in a second. First, in a large data set, quite often you have data that's missing. Okay, so the typical question is you take 20 random days, why will you not necessarily get 20 pieces of data? The obvious answer is data's missing. Okay, uh, next quirk on rainfall. Some values have the symbol TR for trace. This basically means there was some water in there, but it was too low to measure. Okay, for a value to be trace, it basically means when they rounded it, it rounded to zero. So it's going to be less than 0 0.05. Okay, whenever you have to take an average of anything using trace, you just assume all the traces are zero. It's not perfect, but it's the best we can do. Okay, um, here we have an interesting one. So there's a zero here. If I scroll up, this is saying the average visibility for that day was zero. Now I'm fairly sure that's impossible. Like you can't be permanently blind for an entire day. So occasionally you have incorrect data. Okay, very rare, but it does occasionally come up. 
And last, just to mention, as what I was saying earlier, you can notice that some of the values here are quantitative, they have a number, and some are qualitative, they do not have a number. So you've got directions, and there's also something called a both or conversion for wind speed, some of it's moderate light, etc. etc. Okay? And that also occasionally comes up in exam questions. Okay, so yeah, just to reiterate that, for the large data set, you expect to know all the main types of data and any quirks they may have. I'm going to go over a few quickly. So for daily total rainfall, you have those trace values. Okay, and again, for any maths, you just set them as zero. Okay, we've got daily mean wind direction and wind speed. Uh, direction is given something like northeast north where they're basically chopping it chopping the compass into I think it's 16 things so northeast north will be northeast but then go north again so that is northeast north okay rarely comes up but it's worth knowing next for wind speed that is measured in knots that does occasionally come up it's basically an old measurement they still use and maximum gust the same is also measured in knots We have daily mean cloud cover. This is measured in what are called octas, which are basically eighths. So you can have zero eighths all the way up to eight eighths. So you basically have nine options. And again, they like, they like asking some question based upon that knowledge. And you've got visibility, we saw a second ago. That is measured in decameters or tens of meters. Really comes up but worth knowing and pressure is measured i think it's hpa for something pascals yeah with a low h again rarely comes up but worth knowing just in case they're asking a question about pressure okay i'm just going to quickly give you two example questions so you're back in the swing of things so service investigation and variation in daily maximum gust t knots for Camborne in June and July from 1907. She uses a large data set to select a sample of size 20 from June and July for 1907. She selects the first, she's the first values in random from one to four, and then selects every third value after that. So you saw this, this sampling technique is systematic. So for systematics, where you're going up by the same jump each time. Part B, from an large data set, explain why she might not get a sample size of 20. And again, that is the obvious answer. You have data missing occasionally. Okay, not always, but sometimes so it's worth mentioning that. One more, these questions are super popular. It's when you have to give advantages advantages of a certain method. So I talked about these briefly at the start anyway. So the quota sampling, I could say an advantage is you will interview all groups of population. Okay, so they'll all be represented. The disadvantage is basically it's not random. You could introduce, introduce bias by interviewing too many of one particular group. Taking a census of the whole population, again, the advantage is uh, it's not biased, it's very fair, it's very representative, but the disadvantage is it is expensive and timely. Simple random sampling. Uh, you have the advantage of it is perfectly fair, it's perfectly random, okay? And you have the disadvantage is because it is so purely random, you can get unlucky and introduce bias. So the whole point of doing a stratified sample is you would avoid that element. So like by pure chance from a group of 50 men and 50 women, I could just interview 20 men. Just by pure random chance. If I have it stratified, that is no longer possible. So stratified is often viewed as more fair and like the better alternative to simple random sampling. Okay, I hope that made sense. That was a fairly quick recap for you all. You have some questions to try. I basically chopped them into two halves. One half is all about sampling. And the other half is all about the large data set. Okay.
And again, these are fairly standard questions. So, I hope that all makes sense to you. Give us questions to try. Good luck, and thanks for listening.